Opening your film on a smash cut to a corpse. I feel like the movie is trying to tell me something here, but I just can't work it out. Maid is on holiday? The store had a sale on wine and cigarettes? Damn it, movie, stop being so subtle. <laughs> Ah, sudden junior bacon. Also, people who are able to fall asleep lying their head on a desk. There's nothing particularly wrong with it, but I'm not able to do that, so f you if you're able to do it. This oddly placed vase of yellow flowers. Carl, I know that what you're experiencing feels real, but it can't hurt you. I promise. Unkeepable promises. We will now spend 40 seconds transitioning to Rose's next scene by way of an aerial view of this ambulance. And as much as I'm sure defenders of the movie will say it's more interesting than just cutting to the next scene, I think the real reason is because someone wanted to do this zoom through the window shot. The board is down my throat about paying out of pocket for another bed in the residency program. Maybe the board should try giving a sh about the point of our job. Hospital board is full of money-pinching, bureaucracy-loving misers that don't understand the true meaning of Christmas cliche. Look, I'm all for Dutch angles, but only when they add something to the story, and much less when they just make me feel f***ing dizzy. Rose has left the room, but we're still here, which likely means something important is going to happen. Maybe the evil demon is possessing office supplies. Bet it's that sketchy-looking filing cabinet. Oh no, it's the lamp! F***ing possessed lamps! Wait, maybe it's that shifty stapler. Those bastards have taken so many- Ah! It's a phone! It's the black phone! Wait, didn't we already see this movie? Laura positions herself in the best corner of the room for jump scare efficiency. It's like she knows she's in a horror film. I'm a therapist. Do you want to sit down? And can I interest you in a crippling back pain and a numb ass brought about by the most uncomfortable and least therapeutic IKEA discount aisle chairs we could acquire? I'm going to have to ask you a couple of questions that might sound stupid. The thing I said to my buddy right after we watched this film together somehow makes it into the script. I'm a PhD candidate. I'm not some lunatic. Okay? False dichotomies. What is it you're seeing? It looks like people, but it's, it's not a person. Laura will go on to explain her situation in the vaguest and least believable way possible. I'm assuming this is because we're at the start of the movie and it's too early to give away specifics. Even though when Rose gets to this point, she will have very specific examples to pull from. It tells me things. It told me that t today, today's the, today's the day that I'm... I'm gonna... If Laura's saying that whatever this thing is, I'll just call it Smiley, told her that today is the day she's going to die, then why does that never come back up again? Rose only finds out she has around a week to live because someone tells her about the past victims and how quickly they succumb to Smiley. The biggest issue with this movie is that there's no clear explanation as to how Smiley really works. It's okay to give some things an air of mystery, but there should be some clear rules for their particular evil presence. Smile doesn't make its rules clear, and that makes for a very frustrating viewing experience. Rose calls for help while Laura is seizing, but very conspicuously buries herself in this corner so much that she may as well be in a separate room. She's a professional, so wouldn't she be watching Laura for any changes in her condition? Instead, she avoids all possible eye contact just so the movie can set up its Oh no, she's vanished surprise. And speaking of said surprise, let me explain just how bullshit the Oh no, she vanished bullshit is. Rose is acting like she's in a fucking video game with zero peripheral vision. Here's what must have happened. Rose turns around and only focuses on the empty spot where she last saw Laura. And she slowly pans her eyes to the broken flower pot, and only then notices this is Laura in the kitchen. This is not how humans operate. This is how cameras operate. Rose should have noticed Laura the second she turned around. Okay, I'm not gonna pretend to even grasp first aid, but is he checking her goddamn pulse instead of stopping the bleeding from her gushing neck? Movie takes over 13 minutes to smile. But she was a head case, yeah? Before she died, she was smiling. Yeah, she sounds f***ing crazy to me. I feel like Detective Berkeley and Joel got together ahead of time and decided to play out this interview as good cop and be as offensive as possible about mental health at every opportunity cop. Why are all these establishing shots 14 minutes long and taken from orbit? This movie should have been a tight 90 minutes, but instead it is filled with stretches like this, where all we learned is that Rose has a cat, she knows how to shower, and she probably enjoys white wine a bit too much, and how are we rewarded for the three minutes it took to communicate these things? A cheap f***ing jump scare, of course. Maybe we we should bail on dinner tonight. We can! Yes, you f***ing can! Rose is hours after witnessing an actual suicide in front of her very eyes and she's happy going out to enjoy a steak dinner? Not like you're bailing to stay home and watch f***ing murder she wrote, which would also be acceptable. See, this is exactly why you have to get out of that girl's hospital. Rose, there have to be plenty of crazies out there who will actually pay you for your time. Between the cop from earlier and now these two, I'm beginning to feel like all of the peripheral characters in this movie are purely here to demonstrate the vilest views of mental health. Look, I know people like this exist, but how is Rose surrounded by so many of them, especially considering her line of work? Just going to go ahead and get the sin out of the way for the eventual death of the cat, because seriously, f*** off, smile. Mustache did not need to be part of your agenda. You okay? No, because this is yet another scene where all I've learned is that the house has an alarm and the cat needs food. What's next? A step-by-step -step guide on how to make a cup of tea? Morning, Doc. 
cannot be reiterated enough that it is f***ing insane that Rose is back at work less than 24 hours after witnessing Laura's violent death. And if that is perfectly normal in the real world, that makes it even more of a f***ing sin. Really? They roped the f***ing mug into this too? Yesterday, a patient in your care killed herself brutally in front of you. I know this might be a me thing, and Cal Penn is a fine actor, but it's hard to take him seriously when all I can see is Kumar Patel wanting to go to White Castle. Who's this lamp for? What is it lighting up? And why is it the most interesting thing in the scene? Why am I upside down again? Look as frustrated as you like, Rose, but it is totally within your power to have the sellotape ready to go instead of wrapping the gift and wondering why it isn't magically holding itself together when you reach for the phone. Honestly, the most concerning thing about this movie is not knowing how much of her glassware Rose is going to break before this movie ends. <laughs> While Rose does hallucinate the initial call from the security company, or should I say that's what I think happens. Anyways, my question is, what actually set off the alarm? The real police show up and can't find any intruder. So did the smile entity set the alarm off? How exactly did it do that? Why exactly did it do that? Why is it f***ing around with little piddly stuff at the forefront of its own haunting of Rose when it could just be going after her full throttle? This is following the exact same bullshit rules your average poltergeist ripoff follows. <laughs> <laughs> She's not even pretending to hit any of the actual buttons on the number pad. Unless the code includes tapping unmarked spots outside of the keypad. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to judge Rose for jumping at the sudden telephone. Based on what we've seen so far, I think it follows that before you die, you hear the ring. Also, ring phones aren't f***ing scary. You know what is scary? The fact that Rose still has a f***ing landline in 2022. <laughs> Thinking you'll have an easier time locating your cat with dry food when you have the good wet sh jump scares, man. And this one thinks it's so f***ing clever because the movie knows we're all leaning in to listen to whatever it is Rose thinks she heard. But that trust is shattered when you pull shit like this. Like, what is the curse getting out of randomly scaring Rose? And if it's just to stress her out, could it not be a little more creative? <laughs> Rose! Wow, Trevor got out there fast. You could almost say it was like he was A-Train. Listen, the metaphor that a smile much like makeup is often worn to cover up what's really going on beneath the surface isn't lost on me. I'd even say it's a great observation. But there are only so many angles you can come at this concept from, and I feel like we hit them all in the first 30 minutes. Someone should make this into a short film. I bet it would f***ing rule. Why don't you please show me sister to the adult refreshments? Drinking alcohol at a kid's birthday party. I know a lot of parents will hate this sin, but it doesn't make the concept any less weird. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> you yeah. It's happening, all right. The demon that feeds on trauma is continuing to f*** with Rose in the most oddly specific ways possible. If it's going for maximum bang for its buck, why didn't it kill the cat in front of her? Or have her kill her nephew or sister? Or have the cat kill her nephew and sister? Okay, maybe it can't force her to kill things, but then who killed the cat? None of this is ever explained. Something is threatening me. Some kind of a evil spirit or energy. Okay, Rose ends up being right about this, but as a mental health professional, shouldn't she be entertaining the idea that this actually is driven by her own trauma? The whole point of hallucinations is that they feel like the real thing when they're happening. So why is she so quick to accept a demon is at work here? Mental illness. You can inherit it from a parent. I looked it up. Why would you look that up? I wanted to know what I was potentially hitching my entire life to. Holy lack of mental health awareness, Batman. The fiance too. And considering I've seen more convincing examples of sexual chemistry at colonoscopies, I have to wonder why these two are even together, let alone f***ing engaged. If this is how he understands not only her chosen profession, but her history with her mom as well. Trevor, please. Please. F***ing Trevor. <laughs> She went to the effort of highlighting what she needed, but didn't copy and paste it? Unnecessary typing is unnecessary. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if I believed that I was being plagued by a curse or some sort of demon, sleeping with the lights on would just become my new normal. Especially when said demon has just called to me out of the f***ing darkness. It was because he saw that awful woman kill herself. He watched someone die by suicide. Rose is discovering the common theme here is that each victim witnessed a suicide, had a period of mania, and then committed suicide themselves. But if Smiley is feeding off the mental torture, then why not keep torturing them? If it's feeding off the suicide, there are sadly tens of thousands of suicides every year in the U.S. alone. Does the demon really have to create more? Just please give me the name. Please just give me the name. Get the f out of my house! The good news is they shouldn't be too hard to find info on. I mean, how many get the f*** out of my houses could there be in the phone book? Also, phone books. I need to know if he had been involved in any other recent police reports. Come on, are you serious? This is my one day off. This is the man who turned up at her place of work to see if she was okay, and now he's saying that looking up info on someone connected to the suicide that she witnessed is too much effort on his day off? the f*** away with your false tension. I wouldn't have been shocked in the slightest if he agreed to help her without question. Can you please tell me what this is all about? Joel, you said you weren't gonna ask me any questions. No, you said I wouldn't ask you any questions. Joel would be grinning from ear to ear at CinemaSense. Do you have a printer? 
We don't hear the answer, but since Rose has documents in the next scene, I'm going to guess that Joel said yes, and that is all the horse No one has a home printer anymore, and if they do, it doesn't f***ing connect to the thing you need it to connect to. And even if it does, it's always out of f***ing ink. Personal printers are the biggest lie capitalism ever sold us and have broken up more families than drugs and affairs combined. Fact. I called her. Why? Because you've been acting completely unhinged. Scene does not contain Russell Crowe driving. My eyes are open now. I have been cursed. I know she's going through some shit, but does Rose ever once think about the words she's saying? Can she really blame people for not believing her when she starts conversations like this? She even has evidence with her that looks mighty suspicious, so why not open with that instead of the most outrageous statement she can think of? It's what killed Mustache. It was at the party yesterday, but you could see it. Yesterday? So Rose woke up, went to see Carla from Scrubs, got her ex-boyfriend to look up police reports, went home to find her fiance and her therapist having a conversation, and then over to her sister's before the sun f went down? Yesterday, my smiley ass. Holly. This movie made 105 million domestic. <laughs> You would think, since the movie took the time to pan over to Jackson's reaction to Rose losing her mind, that he would factor in later to the plot. And you would be wrong. After you left, I kept digging. These cases, this same pattern, it goes back further. I understand the horror movie cops are dumb cliche, because if they were really good at their job, the movie would end before it got started. However, I'm still seeing the fact that zero cops before Joel noticed the odd connections to all the suicides. I'm not saying they would have gone straight to a smiling entity preying on the victims, but there should be some fucking reports on all this shit. So far, I found 20 cases involving 19 suicide victims with a direct line linking them all together. Okay, so we're learning that there is a chain of people witnessing suicides who are then committing suicides themselves. But how is the demon picking its victims? Is it just whoever happens to be nearby any time between the four to seven day mark? I'm asking now because I have so little confidence that we'll actually get answers later. What you're saying is that this thing is jumping around from person to person and it is causing them to kill themselves? Yeah, you could almost say it follows them. So my patient, she was terrified, but she was not suicidal. How does Rose know that with this much certainty? She had never seen Laura before that day, and she only talked to her for a few minutes before she died. I believe Rose is a great therapist, but I don't believe she can read minds. How long was it between each victim's death? None of them survived longer than a week. I feel like I've heard that before. Can't exactly place where I've heard it, but what Joel is saying has a certain ring to it, doesn't it? Also, what is it with these curses and arbitrary countdowns? Okay, at least this one isn't locked into one week, but why is it waiting at all? Why isn't it just going from person to person in a matter of hours? Is it so that it doesn't get found out? And why doesn't it mix it up and wait a month or a year? Make the cop leave. Not gonna happen, pal. It happens. That's the only way you can get rid of it. The only way. All right, it may be a way, but how the hell could he possibly know it's the only way? What if Rose found a way to convince a doctor to put her in a medically induced coma? If she can't commit suicide and this thing feeds on trauma, wouldn't it eventually die? Whatever that f***ing means for a spirit. Also, how did that first guy in Brazil even figure this shit out? He just thought, you know, I'm going to try killing someone and see if that skips me in the train. I'll better make sure there's a witness, too. Why did that asshole get a step-by-step -step guide and no one else did? She has to make sure there's a witness for it to pass, too, because this thing needs trauma to spread. So what happened? What happens if there isn't a witness? It feeds on trauma. Why can't it feed on the trauma of the family of the victim? Why is it picking on a stranger that just happens to witness the death? What if that stranger just happens to not give a shit and isn't traumatized at all? Driving, glancing, house entering, window dressing. What does it all mean? I mean, excitement? I feel like I'm more familiar with the inside of this goddamn car than I am with most of my blood relatives. No, 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 no. Imagine if Rose actually does kill Carl here. For one thing, the movie would be over, and it would give the movie a pretty ballsy ending. And yeah, I guess this movie does still kind of have a ballsy ending, but my main point is it could have ended here. I want it to end here. We're about to find out this is all a demon-inspired delusion, but shit, man. You have got to respect the detail on this whiteboard. Smiley must have a great memory. As long as I'm alone, I can deprive it of what it needs. That doesn't make any sense. Um, based on the facts available, it actually makes total f***ing sense, Joel. Might be extreme and surrounded by a movie that doesn't make any sense, but the logic itself is sound. Why am I upside down? Down again! F it, here's a sin for every second my visual axis has been f***ed with without my consent rounded to the nearest 100. And now we're in Final Destination territory where Rose will attempt to Devon Sawa herself away in the middle of nowhere, hoping that will break the chain. Man, people were really in the mood for It Follows the Ring to the Final Destination in the fall of 2022, I guess. I mean, it's cool. I'm not holding a grudge or anything. What's two minutes long and doesn't build anything like the tension it thinks it does? This scene! No one will be seated while Rose is seated for 27 seconds. I guess knowing that no one will be going by her mom's old place makes it a good location to be by yourself. But she also knows this entity likes to f*** with 
with her constantly. And in this scenario, of course it's going to take on the persona of her dead mother and try to freak her the f*** out. Why didn't she just get a hotel room? You can even self-check into hotel rooms now. And you'd have electricity and cable and running water, but no. Let's go to the one place that encases all of Rose's most traumatic experiences and is a literal fire hazard because that makes so much f***ing sense. Why are you doing this to me? Because your mind is so inviting. Are we... are we blaming the f***ing victim of trauma for being too susceptible to trauma? Now, I don't think the movie really wants that to be the takeaway here, but I'm definitely seeing it for giving me no idea what it actually did intend that takeaway to be. The movie thinks that by making someone taller, that makes them scarier. And that is not true. At least not in this case. It does, however, make it funnier. So if that's what Smile's going for, congrats. You can't escape your own mind, Rose. You can't escape it either. Rose faces her trauma head on, stares it in the face and says, F*** you, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. Which would have been a super powerful moment if it wasn't undermined in a few minutes when we find out this is all an illusion and Rose is killed by the trauma monster anyway. Does Rose really think this solves her problems? Does she really believe you can just burn up a ghost? Holy sh**, she does think that. And yeah, this all ends up being in her head, but regardless, even in her head, Rose shouldn't think that you can just set fire to a ghost. For most of my life, I've been afraid of letting people get too close. Great, you know what's a great cure for that? A smile and a skip. No, 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 no. Rose. The entity apparently has the foreknowledge to take the form of the person who in reality will show up right afterwards. We need more forward thinking individuals like that protecting this country. Vincent D'Onofrio should leave his velociraptors behind and start getting the smile army up and running. I mean, there are heavy handed metaphors and then there's whatever this shit is that I can only describe as a meteor sized analogy for trauma that wiped out every known example of subtlety ever to have existed in this in any parallel timelines. Also, I feel like at some point there was just a writer's room thinking of all the different horror movies they could take things from and someone said we haven't used Hellraiser yet but I'm not sure how that could even work and then someone else chimed in with oh we're gonna make that fucking work I don't know if the movie just wanted a shocking ending or spent the last two hours attempting to explain that even the strongest people can fall prey to dark thoughts and darker actions I applaud the attempt but I'm sinning the execution also movie ends with some juxtapole bullshit by playing lollipop lollipop after its shocking finale for no other reason than to be jarring Hey, let's turn that frown upside down. Hey, Carl, good to see you. If you hang up on me, you'll die just like your mother. Do you want to die, Sydney? Oh, what's in the box? Put it on. Just, Put it's, it's loading. <laughs> Hello! Rose? Why so serious? You wish that I would die? I learned it by watching you! 